God is so good, is he not? Amen. Uh, amen. I, I appreciate the Lord and all that he does for me. Amen. He's just an awesome God. He's a great God. He's a great God. Amen. It's an honor to stand before you and minister the word of the Lord to you today. Uh, something I don't take lightly. I appreciate Pastor Shepherd for the opportunity to minister the word. Amen. Give honor to him and his family. Uh, my, my beautiful, wonderful wife. Amen. That supports me. That gave me divine instruction before leaving the house today. Amen. Lord, help me listen. I got to go home tonight. Amen. But I appreciate her prayers to support my son, my daughter, that always pray for me, always there for me, and I really appreciate them. Amen. God is just good, is he not? Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> I have not preached from paper in a while. But we're going to do that today. So uh, it's the word of the Lord, whether it's on an iPad or a piece of paper or whatever. I believe I have a word of the Lord today. Amen. I, and uh, I believe it'll be interesting. Amen. Amen. So why don't we all stand together, if you will, for the reading of the word. And if you will, turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. And then from there we'll go to Isaiah 28. And uh, Galatians 6, 9. And the help of the Lord will... <coughs> will uh, build a little foundation here. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Isaiah 28, 9 says this, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with, a stam for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak. To his people. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says this. And let us not be weary in well, well doing. Everybody say doing. Let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. You, will, you, will you pray for me? Please pray for me. Amen. As we pray. Let's pray together. Lord we love you. I thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your house, dear God, to hear your word. I pray that you would help me as I minister your word today, dear Lord. I, I pray that it would be a blessing, dear God, and help me, Lord, just express it the way I feel it in my heart and in my mind, dear Lord, that at the end of this lesson, Lord, we may grow closer to you. Help us, Lord, to be the doers of your word not hearers only. Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I want to start today by, I don't know, it's just, uh, if, you, if you've known me for a long time, you know that I, I am not somebody who builds things. Uh, I'm not. I've just, I'm just, you know, a couple of years ago, when the ladies were doing uh, the fall auction, and they asked for people to build things so they can sell, they were trying to convince me to just uh, build a cross. <laughs> you know, just two boards, cross them and nail them together, and at least do that. 
And I wasn't confident in doing that because I knew that I would somehow mess it up. I am just not somebody who would take a hammer and nails and some wood and, and put things together. That's just not me. Uh, growing up, my dad was not in construction. He was in tire service. Now, if you have a flat, I got you. Whether it's a semi-truck, a tractor, or a bicycle, whatever. Tire service, I'm it. But construction, woodworking, that type of stuff is not me. So today, but I, I want to talk to you for a few minutes on the topic of uh, the workbench. Amen. Because two years ago, I was uh, surfing, not surfing, but just looking through the internet, and I ran across this, uh, I think it's called the family handyman thing section and there was a picture there of a workbench and I don't know something inside me says you know what I think I can do that and I was two or three years ago so when my family asked me what I wanted for my birthday I said I want a Lowe's gift card for this amount is I'm going to build this workbench. I'm going to build it. Two years ago. I had a thought. And I had an intention. I had the instructions. I had the plan. In the next slide. For two years. Next slide, please. There it is. Two years. This is my workbench. I had the money. I had the plan. I had the resources. I had the intention. But for two years, that's what I had. Oh, I visited Lowe's with the gift card. Be patient with me. I walked the aisles. I considered spending the money on something else, but in the back of my mind, I knew this $100 gift card was for my workbench. And this was the result of good intentions for two years. Absolutely nothing. <clears throat> well, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe two or three weeks ago, I finally had a, like, a full day off. And, uh, you know, I said, what am I going to do with this day? And so I said, you know what? I'm going to build a workbench. The day finally arrived a couple or two or three weeks ago. So I went to Lowe's. <laughs> I walked around Lowe's for a long time. Started looking. Maybe there was something else that would interest me that I would want to buy. But I finally wandered to the, is it called, I don't know what it's called, construction area where all the wood is. All right. I wandered over there. I felt somewhat out of place because there were a lot of men walking around like they were very intentional with what they were doing, what they were looking for, what they wanted. They were dressed with, you know, construction clothes. <laughs> and I kind of felt out of place. Because I went to look for two by fours, and I didn't know that there were more than like one or two or three options of two by fours. Because I had to buy 15 of them according to the plan. And I looked at some, and I'm like, oh, that, that, they just, I, I don't know. And then I said, I have to look 15 of these, and I have to act like I know what I'm doing, and I have no idea. Because the construction of this workbench took two things 15, two by fours, and one sheet of plywood all I needed but I felt so out of place I didn't know and I was a little embarrassed because I'm like okay well I said well that's the cheapest one and I don't like how it looks there's I guess mid one and then some that are like way out of price range so, so I just get the middle ones I mean so that's what I did I, I, well, I'm going somewhere with this so I, so I purchased the supplies next slide and I loaded them up in my truck and I sent out a text to my family, and this is what the text said. Okay, 
Supplies have been purchased for my workbench. If I am missing any fingers by the end of the day, and you gave me a gift card to Lowe's, you are responsible. So I got, I got home, and I backed the truck up into the driveway, and I went into the, sh into the shed, uh, not to the shed, into our garage, and uh, there was space there. And so I was going to clean some things up out of the way, right? And so I, I, I walked out, right, and I, uh, there was a cup with some, some kind of drinks on it. So I, I, I just emptied it out on the yard, and I turned, and I had backed up the truck there. And before I even unloaded any wood, next slide. I hadn't even started yet. And I almost knocked my head out. I sent a picture of this to my wife, my wife about 15, 20 minutes later. said, are you okay? This is what I sent her. I said, oh, I think I was out for about 10 or 15 minutes, but I'm okay now. So it's like, all right, I don't know if it's a good idea. <laughs> I didn't even unload anything. I didn't even plugged in a saw or anything. And I'm already knocking myself out. So, but I didn't quit. Slide five. I set up my work area. And I, <laughs> it's dangerous. I don't even know. Those things have only been used two or three times in 30 years that I've had them. So I went to work. I started doing what was a two-year-old intention. And I went to work on my workbench. Slide six. Now, <coughs> I am not a carpenter, a woodworker, and the plan I was following said it was a two-hour project. <coughs> now, I know there are men here in this building, and I admire you because you could take one piece of wood up and you could just do it, right? Well, Six hours later, I was still working on it. The instructions were interesting. They had a supply section and another section called a cutting list with measurements like this. You need nine, 71, and seven-eighths. Okay, I knew there was a quarter. I knew there was a half. I knew there was a three-quarter. So, yes, I was counting the little lines, okay? I know that eight. Okay, so this is the seven-eighths right here. All right, y'all can laugh at me. That's okay. Took me six hours, I'm telling you. Okay, by the way, I'm a nurse, okay? So I've been, I was a critical care nurse for so many years. And you know that if I, I missed a dose by just a milligram or two for my life and for my career, it's a life and death situation. You know what I'm saying? So I have to be very careful when they tell me, and sometimes it's very intentional. My wife says, you, you go through too much to do something so simple. I'm like, that's how I think because in my career, in my job, if I make a mistake, it's not just <laughs> it's covered up. It's a, it could be a life or death mistake. And I know this wasn't, but that's how I was, a very intentional. So, okay, so this is what it took me. And then I, I, I read somewhere, I heard somewhere, you, you, you measure twice, cut once. Well, I was measuring three or four times before I cut once. But anyway, but it was nine, se and, I, and then four, 68 by seven, eights, and three, uh, four, three, 31 and a half, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Y'all get the picture, right? <coughs> and you know what? They had to be cut just right. They had to just done correctly. In all honesty, as I was cutting wood, I had no idea why I was cutting it. I had no exactly where it was going to fit. I had no idea. But I just followed the instruction, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. At that time, it did not make sense to me. Oh, but later on, when it was coming together. Next slide. Oh, see, I didn't think I could do it, did you? It started coming together, and it started to make sense. Oh, so this is why I cut this many this long or that many that long. It started to make sense. And you know what I ended up with? Next slide. A oh, workbench. All right, next slide. The finished product. All right. And then this is how it looks now. 
Ah, I have those tools on there. I don't know when I use them, but they're there. But that is my ore beams. I added a light to it. I added a rack to it. I, you know why? Two years ago, it was nothing. For two years, it was nothing. Okay, so why are you telling us all this, Brother B? Simply this. You can take that down. Good intentions produce absolutely nothing. Good intentions are basically that. Good intentions. And just provide an empty space. I read some quotes that said, good intentions are not enough. Commitment and sacrifice are necessary. Good intentions are only lies the weak tell themselves. And this is one of my favorite ones that I read. Good intentions are simply not enough. Our character is defined and our lives are determined not by what we want, say, or think, but by what we do. Scripture says it like this in James chapter 2.19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, O vain man, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by faith? No, he was justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son up upon an altar seeing how faith wrought with his works and by works his faith was made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God yet see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only now we need faith we need a vision, we need a purpose, we need faith. But faith alone, without works, is dead. It's just good intentions. It's just a blank wall, an empty space. It's good to have faith, but without faith, it's dead. Without, without faith, without works, is dead. Likewise also was not Rahab, the harlot, justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way for the body for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also faith must produce works read some more scripture in first peter chapter 2 verse 9 says this but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, which what they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. I think this is important because I was reminded of the story of, of the rich man and Lazarus. Everybody say, I'm, I'm royal priesthood. I'm peculiar people. That's not just the preachers, that's everybody. If you remember the story about the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man was rich and had everything. Lazarus was a poor beggar. The rich man never paid any attention to him. They both died. The rich man went to hell. The poor man, Lazarus, went to Abraham's bosom. And somehow they were able to communicate with one another. And the rich man was talking to Lazarus. He said, would you just dip your finger in some water and just drop it to quench my thirst? I said, you can't. We can't do that. There's a big gulf between them. So then the rich man implored, he implored Lazarus, 
or Abraham. And he said, well, send Lazarus down so that he can testify to my brothers. I have five brothers, I think the Bible says. Because if they hear him, then they will be converted. And the response was this. They said, you know who they have? Everybody said, they have me. The response was, your brothers have Moses and the prophets. They have us. You want this world has? They have us. And so the rich man said, no, no, no. If you send back Lazarus from the dead, they'll believe him. But then the scripture says that the response to that says, you know what? If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, a dead man would not persuade them. You want to know how important we are to the kingdom of God? We are the only hope that this world has. Come on, church. You are the only hope of those around you. You are it. That's what they have. They have you. They have you to do works. That's why intentions are not good enough. That's why it's not just good enough to think, oh, I may give my testimony. No, you need to give your testimony. Oh, I just want to invite. At some point, I will invite them to. No, invite them to church now. Because good intentions are just that. They produce absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know, tell in your paper. I go by this, this, way, this way. You have the supplies. You have. I'm talking to the church now. You have the cut list. And they are taught here every Sunday and every Wednesday. And if you go to Bible study and prayer, youth service, Sunday school, they are taught here. You have the cut list. You have the instructions. You have what it takes. Every Sunday and every Wednesday, Ephesians 4.11 says this, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen? We have what it takes to know about salvation about faith, about holiness. And you know how it's taught here? Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. You know what, in the scripture, that was, that was how children were thought, taught. As a matter of fact, when Isaiah was, 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 uh, was writing this, or this written, he was actually kind of mocking the prophets. He was probably telling me, you didn't get back to the basics. Because the children of Israel need to go back to the basics. It's right here. Do it back like little children. If we need to do it like little children, let's do it like little children. But let's get back where we need to get back to. You need to cut it at 71 and 7 eighths. Not at 71 and a half because then it's not going to fit. Oh, come on now. You got to cut so many this length if you want it to come together, right? Well, I don't understand why. Just do it. Obey the word of God. Listen to the man of God. Oh, I need to be baptized in Jesus' name. Well, I don't. The, the Bible says that we need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of our sins. Precept upon precept. We have it. We have it here. We have the teaching that we need here. And everything's measured out. And you may not understand, well, why do, why do I need to dress this way? You may not understand it now. But you just obey the word of God. You just line up to the will of God. One day you're going to be walking and it's all going to fit together. And it's all going to make sense. It's going to work for you, I'm telling you. You may not understand it completely, but obedience to the word of God is always. Everybody say always. It's always right. You know, when I was baptized in Jesus' name, y'all have heard me. I know some of y'all have heard me tell this story many times. When I was baptized in Jesus' name, when I finally, when they had Brother Lango, bless his heart, taught me the Bible study, I said, oh, that's all right, bro. I got you. <laughs> uh, I think I'm okay. But then when I was in church and I couldn't feel God, and Sister Lango was like, I think you know what you need to do. And I was like, you know what? I think I need to be baptized. 
So I said, I think I want, that's all I had to say, right? <laughs> At an apostolic church, you don't, get, you don't get a second choice. I think, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, come on, you're going to be baptized. So they're dragging me back to the room, right, to change. And so on my way, I grabbed a preacher. <laughs> and i never forget, I said, look, I'm in this room. And I said, look, you need to explain it to me one more time. Just explain it to me one more time. And, of course, he explained it to me one time. So I said, let's go. Back then, we had that deep baptistry <laughs> with cold water. And I want to tell you something. When I stood in that baptistry, about to be baptized, I was not 100% convinced. But I was obeying God's word. You feel like you need to tell your testimony sometimes, and you're like, I don't know. Obey it. Obey it. That day I was in a patient's room. I was doing a procedure, and her mom was really nervous. I don't know about my baby. I said, you know what? Let me tell you something. I was there fixing. I said, let me tell you my testimony. Let me tell you how I laid at the table, and I just said, God, I need a miracle right now. And how y- y'all heard my testimony. I go, and how I did it. The next, the next day she came back. She goes, you know what? I've been telling your testimony everywhere I go. And I wonder, what if I would have resisted? You know what I'm saying? But when I was in that baptistry thing, standing there, I can't tell you I was 100% sure. But when obedience came over me, when I was, I held my breath, crossed my hands, and Brother Wesley McLean buried me in the name of Jesus. For the, when I came out of that water, there was no doubt that I had done the right thing. Because when you obey God, when you obey the Word of God, it fits. 78 and 7 eighths, or whatever it was, it fits. Well, I don't know if I should tell my testimony to this person. If you feel that it's not the devil telling you to do it, it's the devil, devil telling you not to do it. Why? Well, it may not make sense then. And that, pace, that, that person may not listen to you right then. Oh, but when it comes together, you're going to have a project. I'm telling you, you're going to have a workbench that is functional. I know this is not what you are used to for me, but I'm telling you, you know, it's time, church, that we get busy. Oh, let me say it again. It's time that we get busy. If you have questions on basic Bible principles, Sign up for the Connections class. If you have questions about discipleship or about giving, sign up for the Christian Life class. You know what? It's time, church, that we just do it. If you say, well, I've never really understand the oneness of God or, or baptism in Jesus' name. I've sat in this congregation for years, and I've heard it. I've heard it preached, and I know it's the right thing, but I really don't understand it. Well, if you've been in this church one day or 30 years, and you still feel that way, you sign up for that Connections class and get it right and get it down and understand it so that you can be functional in the work of God. It's time to get busy. It's time to stop just shopping at Lowe's with, 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 a, with, with a credit card, not knowing what I'm going to pick up. You know you know you got your work. You know your calling. You know what God is calling you to do. You know the thing that he's put in your heart. You know it's there. Stop shopping around and get to the wood where you need to be, as uncomfortable as you may be. Take 15 two by fours and a sheet of plywood and let's start doing something and we need to stop looking at empty spaces good intentions produce nothing because the only thing that's going to matter in the end is what you've done for Jesus Christ We need to get started. I'm, I'm about to finish. Ecclesiastes 19 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. Whither thou goest, if you're going to do something for God, now is the time to do it. Don't wait before it's too late. Paul said it in Philippians 4.12, I know how to be abased, I know how to be abased. How to abound 
everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. But he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The translation says this. He says, I have strength for all things. He says, well, sometimes it says, I can do, well, I can't do anything. Well, really the translation says this. I know how to be hungry. I know how to be full. I know how to be a want. And I know how, how to have everything I need. But you know what? I have strength for when I'm hungry. I have strength for when I'm full. You know what? I have strength for all things. So I can't do nothing. Well, I'm telling you something. You have strength for something. And that strength is that I can do all things through, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know what that word strengtheneth means? Through Christ who empowers me. Or Christ who enables me and gives me the strength that I need. You're not going to do anything in your own strength. You know what we did in our own strength? And you know what we do in our own strength? We sin, we fail, we fall. We say, I can't do it. That's our strength. But Paul's saying, you know what? You got strength for all things. You have strength for all things. You know, there are so many callings, instructions, commands that are given to us, you know, to go, to lay hands on the sick, to teach and to preach and to pray and to testify. How many in this, in this room, and I, I know I bring this up, but how many of you have ever felt the urge to pray for somebody? And you've done it. And you say, well, I don't know. Sister Richards told me right before I came up here, she said, I prayed for you this morning. I prayed hard for you this morning. So she was telling me, you better not mess this up. I didn't waste 30 minutes of my day for you to go up there and make a fool of yourself. But the thing is, is this, it's not just a good intention. You've got to do it. If God tells you to go, go. Just tell you, hey, just share a testimony. Just give a kind word. Encourage somebody. Do it. Oh, well, what they th- it doesn't matter what they think about you. Just do it. You're going to be okay because it's going to fit. I, was, I told Jeremy when he came. And <laughs> of course, I was showing off my workbench. Yeah, I was. You didn't come see this thing. As you know what amazed me? Because you know me. I, I, I was, I was, my, my greatest fear, Brother Gary, is that I was going to be all wobbly, you know, <laughs> have one leg longer than the other, and, and it was going to be all wobbly, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to have to stick something under there to make it, you know. But I said, Jeremy, I, I even told Jeremy, Jeremy, guess what? It didn't even wobble. We're good, man. It's good and strong. You know why? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here, there, a little here, a little there. I cut a little here, I cut a little there. You know, you understand? And initially, it was just empty. It was just an empty space. And sometimes in our calling, it's just empty. And it will always just be empty. Until we start doing things. Until we get that card out of our pocket and go to the section that we need to go. What section? You know your section. You you know exactly what section you need to be shopping at. Because God called it and put it in your heart. If I was to tell you that right now, all, all of you know right now in your mind, oh, my section. I know my section. So what have you been doing with that section? What have you been doing with that workplace? What have you been doing that home what, what have you been doing around those friends what, what what have you been doing because you know your section it feels uncomfortable it feels uncomfortable obviously because i'd never picked out a two by four for a purpose before and i had to get 15 but I did, you know what i did the best i could because that's all i could do and you know what god wants from you the best you can do that's all he wants just step out on faith and believe. But don't just have faith. Because faith without works is dead. 
Take a step of faith. Challenge yourself and do something you, for God that you haven't done before. That's all stand. What was the first thing that happened to me? Remember? The first thing that happened to me was that I hit, <coughs> I hit my, <coughs> excuse me, I hit my head. What does that mean? It was just a reminder that whenever you decide to do something for God, the devil, <coughs> the devil is there just waiting to discourage you. Somebody something to you, and you're going to feel like, you know what? That wasn't going to stop me that day. I had already brought the wood home. I had nowhere to put it. As a matter of fact, after I built the workbench, my wife says, (laughs) where are you going to put it? (coughs) You know what? I found a place. And when you start doing thanks for God and you can look back and say you know I remember I remember my intentions I remember when I went shopping I remember when I when I fell I remember when I felt like giving up because it was so hard Proverbs 24 16 says for a just man falls seven times and rises up again Galatians said this do not grow weary in well doing you just keep working for in due season you shall reap if we faint not Psalms 33, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. You know who's on your side? God is. He has not stopped working on you. He has not given up on you. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident in this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know what he's constantly doing? He's doing it. He's constantly doing it perfecting you he called you he equipped you he has so much confidence in you that he demonstrated his love for you on calvary he did it and he took the spirit that was placed in him that was in him and placed it in you so that you could pick up the mantle and get to work that was a thought became reality when i started doing something i want to encourage you in your ministry your calling the lord has been dealing with you it's time to begin now is the accepted time It's time to get out of your head, out of your heart, and it's time to buy the material. Church, it's time to build. Amen. Sunday two weeks ago, Brother Brimley preached, what on earth are you doing? I believe God is calling us. Some of us know what God intends for our lives, but we are satisfied shopping, walking down the aisle and that one, but never buying in because of doubt. Lack of confidence, not sure where to start. But I'm telling you, it's time to get busy. It's time to recommit ourselves to the work of God because God has called us to do something. I use the work bitch example simply because this. Because if you look that up in Family Handyman, it says this, a simple. It's a simple. It's not a complicated word. There ain't no drawers, no fancy things. It's just simple. A simple workbench. To me, it was sophisticated. It should have taken two hours. It took me six to seven hours. But you know what? It's there now. Because I decided to do it. And it's the same with your ministry. God has called you to do a work. It's time to answer the call. And it's time to do it. Well, it's just going to be simple. That's all right. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. You just need to do it. I challenge you today to do something before Sunday. You know your intentions are. You know what your intentions are. You know who that person is that you need to invite. I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you my battle. I'll tell you my battle. I'm treating, or we're treating a patient that has been a friend of mine for over 30 years, a fellow nurse. I thank care of her for the last two or three days. Now, I've prayed for her several times, but yesterday, for some reason, 
My intention is to pray all day. But I was busy. I had other patients. And I'd go by there and do this. I'd go by and do this, my intentions. I'd go by to give her medication. My father had to go to another place. And I said, okay, God, before I leave today, I'm going to pray for her. This is an intention. She didn't know. She had no idea how much I fought yesterday, all day long, inside of me. I'm uncomfortable. She knows I'm a preacher. She knows I come to church. I prayed with her before, but yesterday, for some reason, for some reason, I was struggling with it. I can't tell you why. Oh, you're just weak in the flesh. No. I have good intentions. But I am in the flesh. <laughs> so finally, before she left, I put everything down. I went over there. I took her by the hand. I said, so and so, I will pray for you. And I said, God, you just take care of my friend. From the top of her head to the sole of her feet, let her feel your presence and your power. Heal her body. Help her through this process and strengthen her every day and help me help her. You know, she grabbed me. She hugged my neck. She goes, you know, Vidal, I've always loved you. Why do you say that, Vidal? Because you see the challenges? You see how the devil is? But now, thirsty for prayer. Thirsty for me to put a hand on her and pray for her. I want you all to pray for her because we're going to get a Bible study. And she's going to be baptized in Jesus' name. Gonna be a workbench there. You understand? I know, baby. I'm taking too long. I know I am. I got the I got the signal. But I just want to encourage you today. Let your intentions become realities. Do something this week. Invite somebody to church. Call somebody. Encourage them. Somebody that's been in your heart. Call them and tell them how much they mean to you and how much you've missed them being here. You know, Brother Brimbry said it, and it was interesting that I was supposed to teach next Wednesday, last Wednesday, but I was sick before. Right after, he, I was like, oh, my goodness, God, you're lining things up. I mean, you know what you're doing, obviously. We need to fill the house. But the only way the house is going to be filled is if we do something. We need to do something. So I challenge you to do something. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, that you would help us. Do something, dear God, for your kingdom. Every individual in this house has a calling. Every individual, dear God, knows their calling. I pray that you would touch them and you would help them, dear God. That our intentions become actions, dear God, and our actions produce a product that gives you glory, oh Lord, I pray.